Hi everyone, my name is Daphne Ayas and I'm the director of Vit de Revit. Um, I want to welcome you all. Vit de Revit, as some of you already know, is, um, is a public institution with Rotterdam as its base um, that is committed to the production, presentation of ambitious works by visual artists all around the world. So we have a wonderful exhibition upstairs that you can see tomorrow. Um, core to our mission is partnering up with artists, thinkers, and writers of all generations to enable them to create new work. And essential to that is actually that we push them to go into new directions. So that's our imperative. With the David Explores, developments in contemporary art worldwide and presents this through exhibitions, theoretical and educational programs, public events and communications. We believe that contemporary art is central to the examinations of ideas and questions that really shape and inspire us. So more and more with my directorship, we're going to be looking at civilizational issues, and I'm really, really happy that we have the distinguished guests today to set the tone for the next three years where I will be the director. Um, so for us, it's really interesting and imperative that we look at contemporary art as a catalyst for contemporary thought, um, and it is a way for us to understand our political and social history. So in order to write the next chapter of visual arts vis-a-vis -vis culture at large, we're going to be increasingly collaborating with artists and non-artists, including independent thinkers, academicians. Uh, so we are really geared up to turn Viterevit into a think tank environment, not only a great exhibition um, place. So um, in whatever we do, whatever titles we use, whether we're artists, academicians, sociologists, politicians, um, writers, in, 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 in whatever we do, whatever titles we kind of give ourselves, what we do is really to make sense of our times and to embrace a sense of cultural activism. So whatever we do, it's really, that's what we do. I think that's what brings us all together also tonight. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished speakers, who I hope will be setting the tone and the intellectual charge for the year to come. And they will be introduced by Monica Shevchik, who organized the evening. Um, so I will give the microphone to Monica. Thanks very much, Daphne. So I am extremely honored and very proud to be presenting on Superdiversity by Tariq Ramadan, which is the second in our Reflections series. Um, this is a book series that we started with the previous director, uh, Nicholas Schaffhausen. Um, and the idea was to pose um, key problems to public intellectuals and to receive their thought and then translate it. Um, into Dutch and another language that seemed appropriate. Um, the first book was on surplus value by Diedrich Diedrichsen, and for the second, we wanted to uh, probe what diversity meant in our culture. And um, in kind of starting to think about this, we came across a paper which um, discussed a new concept uh, which was called superdiversity. And um, super diversity, I'm just going to read the quote because it's better that I don't mess this up. And this was actually um, introduced first by uh, Steven Vertovic from uh, Max Planck Institute. Um, and he put forward the notion um, because of the need to, I quote, reevaluate conceptions and policy measures surrounding diversity by way of moving beyond an ethnofocal understanding and adopting a multi-dimensional approach. Um, we thought this was a really important thing to understand, how can we have a multi-dimensional concept of super diversity. But in reading um, this first treatise, there still seemed to be a kind of um, emphasis on immigration as the key problem of diversity. Let's say and we wanted to open open that up and, and kind of explore it further. And the person in our midst who seemed most appropriate to address the issue was Professor Tariq Ramadan, who was then um, a professor at um, 
Erasmus University and also a special advisor to the um, Rotterdam government. Um, it was very strange that at the moment that we decided that this was our man, uh, this man was summarily dismissed from his posts and uh, a huge kind of controversy ensued which in fact continues. Um, for us this was kind of a shame but also we thought it might be a good uh, chance to, in the midst of all this kind of media uh, frenzy, to actually offer uh, Professor Ramadan a chance to reflect. This is what the series is about. The essays are 10,000 words. It's not about offering a kind of press release or a short blurb about what, you know, diversity is in the way that we often hear politicians dealing with the term. It's really to think through it and to understand it multidimensionally. And uh, this is very much what we received. Uh, you will have to read the book to know what I mean. Um, and we decided to uh, add a Dutch, uh, Dutch translation, of course, but also an Arabic translation. Um, because, of course, Professor Ramadan has a history of engaging with the Islamic community um, and the Arabic community. He, is, he was able to check the Arabic translation and advised us on a proper translation into Arabic of the title, which is actually very difficult. There is no ready-made uh, equivalent to super diversity in Arabic. So we worked through several, um, several different options. And the option we chose was a kind of inflection of diversity that um, emphasizes its um, constructivist, constructive principles, which I think we all were quite um, happy with. Okay, I will let you read the book to find out the rest. Uh, tonight, um, we have invited uh, another professor from Erasmus University, a former colleague of um, Tariq Ramadan's, Willem Schinkel, who um, I think is probably also known to many of you because he has, apart from his academic work as a sociologist, I think he is uh, one of the foremost public intellectuals in the Netherlands. And we thought he would be a wonderful person to engage and to offer a first response and then um, to engage in a conversation with Professor Ramadan. And we also, um, some of you were early enough to um, witness a screening or of a slide presentation by Wendelin van Oldenburg, who is a Rotterdam-based artist, that um, subsequent to meeting Professor Ramadan at our morality conference in November 2011, or 2010 actually, um, invited him to participate in a work that she realized for the Venice Biennial last year, which is called Supposing I Love You and You Also Love Me. Um, I think we might leave it for an extra day if we can, if some of you did miss it, because it's a, it's a really interesting, um, I think, example of a kind of uh, pragmatic approach to diversity, trying to work it out by making a slide presentation, by making a film, by working with people. Um, so she preferred to offer the work as her response, in a way, as her contribution. Um, but I will ask her to maybe offer a response to the conversation after all, or, or some kind of a comment. Um, I had a long list of accomplishments that I was going to read out as a bio, but maybe we can keep it casual. And if you really want to know, I can tell you about them later. Um, but I do have some thank yous and acknowledgments before we begin. I'm sorry to delay one more minute, but there were actually a lot of people that uh, participated in the making of this book. It's one essay by one author, but it is um, also about translating it and making it accessible to as wide an audience as possible. And for that, we have to thank Walter van der Star for the Dutch translation and Solange de Boer for the editing in Dutch of the essay. And also, um, I have to... 
read this out here. And the Salam Shudri and Sahar Mandur for the Arabic translation. And also for the copy editing in Arabic, we are incredibly lucky to have Amira Gad working at Vitadavit. And she was not only um, just checking and proofing, but actually really a wonderful dialogue partner on the entire project. She's sitting right there. And I just wanted to really offer a special thank you for her contribution to this book. So without further ado, I'm just going to invite our two conversation partners to take the stage and um, thank you again for being here and the floor is yours. Okay, I'll just start with a response then. <laughs> uh, first of all, welcome back. After my university sort of dismissed you, uh, it's good to have you back. I thought they were going to dismiss you because you said Pele was a better player than Johan Cruyff, but they have found another reason. So um, let's talk about the book. Uh, I like this book very much. Lots of it in it uh, I find uh, very sympathetic. But this would be a boring discussion if I would only emphasize that. So I'm going to pose some, some point out, point out some some critical points and also some points that I would like to attach to. Um, the book is, in in a sense, uh, revolves around the notion of a shared universal, of finding a shared universal, and I think um, uh, that is very interesting. Although there is one mm, problem there, um, I think. In a sense, you might say our uh, diversity today um, already has a shared universal. I mean, to, to speak of diversity involves a common ground from which diversity can be seen. And our shared universal in that sense is maybe conflict. And conflict is, of course, very productive. From a, from a viewpoint of justice, it's not very uh, sympathetic, but conflict is very productive in social life. And I find the essay then to be, in a sense, uh, about a kind of domestication of diversity. And I think that's a threat there. But I have to say you also acknowledge that. So um, I like to, to pick up positively on the notion of, uh, of the shared universal. For me, this uh, shared universal is um, best embodied by the public sphere. And I take your book actually to also involve uh, an incitement to strengthen an even cosmopolitan public sphere. Because you say a shared universal involves a common ground, and, or, or a common space even, and that common space I think should be the public space. And uh, this shared universal then should not be something that can be attained actually, but that is enacted in the, in the public sphere. So the public sphere to me would be a kind of enactment of this universal, which does not mean that we actually get closer to this universal, with, that we actually achieve this. Um, and I find that very sympathetic. And I, to me, that's the main point that I take from the book. Um, I, what I then also find somewhat problematic in the book is that there are lots of concepts there that uh, I think are somewhat vague. So you say, for instance, tolerance is problematic, but you, you put forward respect. And there are lots of concepts like uh, trust, uh, recognition, uh, love even, uh, humanity, reason. And you put these concepts forward as a way of saying we should not be simply philosophers, we should not theorize, but we should be engaged with daily life. So it's a kind of worldly uh, philosophy. and. Um, to me, I think lots of those concepts, uh, first of all, not really get us closer to daily life because daily life is riddled with structural inequalities that we cannot really properly address through these rather vague and general terms that nobody really objects to. I mean, they're fine, but they don't really address the structural inequalities underlying uh, our problems of diversity. Um, so. 
to me, the political dimension is something that is under thematized. Now, in the conclusion of the book, you say something about this. There you speak of the culturalization of all these uh, problems of diversity and of the role of social class. I would have liked to have seen more of that. There is, so this notion of the worldly philosophy made me think of uh, Robert Halbronner's book about the worldly philosophers, which is actually translated in Dutch as the philosophers of the daily bread. And that is much more concrete, in a sense, than the philosophers of the daily life, which is very uh, general, in, in a sense. So I like the, uh, to conclude, I, uh, and these are the points that we can discuss, maybe. I like the general idea of this uh, shared universal. I see it embodied in the ideal of a cosmopolitan public sphere open to debate. But I think then that lots of the concepts that you use to delineate such a discussion uh, are so general that they m sort of fail to really ca capture the political sense of what's going on. They, they lack the political urgency. Uh, in a sense, you are uh, tempted too much to get into the cultural debate and to speak of values and to speak of the need for us to understand each other. I think below that is a political dimension that needs to be addressed in very clear and precise terms. So maybe there, there are some starting points for you to respond. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. This is a sympathetic <laughs> critique. I don't know, would have been a not sympathetic uh, critique because I think you are touching a very important point. Let me start by thanking Monica and Amira for the, the job they have been doing because I have been in touch with them over the last few years, in fact, to be able to get this book uh, uh, published. And thank you for what you have been doing. Uh, and putting me through people afterward, we were together about the, the, the movie and, and the film that you have been doing. I've been working with, with uh, some people here. So I want to thank you for that and for your trust because it was not easy at the time where we had all this controversy uh, to go ahead and to say, yes, we will go for this project because it, it was more important. In fact, it was kind of a, an answer, a response to the controversy itself. And let me start by saying this because I don't want to come here and just to respond to what you are saying. Uh, uh, just before we started, I said to Wilhelm that I am quoting him in many ways in all over the world about the, uh, on the work that he's doing. But more importantly, I'm not here just talking to a, a, a former uh, colleague at Erasmus University. There have few people in this country when it started who were courageous and spoke out and said how much it was unjust the way I was treated, and he's one of them. So he's a public figure, but he's someone within university who showed courage, consistency, and for that I want to publicly thank you. I did it many times, but I think that this is important. And, and when I heard that you were going to come, uh, it's not only uh, out of respect and full of respect, but uh, with great uh, uh, recognition and, and acknowledgement that I, I want you also to understand in which way uh, uh, our relationship evolved through all this very sad story at our Erasmus University. So this is one chapter and thank you again and, and for your support and your courage in these very specific and difficult times. You are th th saying three things that are quite important. Uh, uh, because what was important for me when I was asked to think about super diversity, for me, uh, and I said it in the introduction, there are three things that are important. And the first is really not to come to a discussion about diversity at the periphery, what it could mean, but at the center. I am advocating that the first dimension, and it's coming from all the spiritual and religious traditions, but also philosophical tradition, because I'm quoting lots of philosophers, are saying the first is this inner diversity, which is important. And in the inner diversity, as I was trying to translate it, it's always connected to something which is peace with your own self, but power. And the first chapter that I'm touching, which is connecting to what you are saying, is diversity and power. Because to speak about diversity in philosophical terms and, and to come with something which is an ideal you know, perception of our daily life, you know, this common philosophy, that's all good. But I was myself impressed by the discussion that Ahmed Khan had in India with Gandhi, 
when Gandhi was saying, yes, you know, uh, we are all the sons of, you know, Harry Jan, and, and, and we, not, we should not speak about untouchable, we should speak about sons of uh, God. And Ahmed Katz said, no, I'm sorry. These people are marginalized. These people are facing injustice. Let us talk about Dalit, people who are untouchable. So the first stage when it comes to dealing with diversity is to acknowledge the fact that there is power struggle. To avoid power struggle, it's power in itself. Only those who have power are able to forget about power. Uh, but those who are facing, they say, okay, we speak about diversity, but the starting point of diversity is respect. So I completely agree with this. My, my take was not a sociological or, philosophy, or political take, but it was the starting point. So I started with diversity and power, which I think it's very important in anything which has to do even with the civil society that you are talking about. The second point, which for me it's also important is, and I, I'm starting with this, is the, the way we deal with diversity is, is as important as what in the substance of diversity itself. And I'm talking about, you know, this, uh, are we, it's coming in fact from an intuition that we had in Bergson philosophy, the French philosopher, who was saying there are two things knowing something. One from outside, so you have only viewpoints, uh, and the other one is from within. So you enter within the object and you get an inner knowledge of the object and then you look at the viewpoints. So the whole thing, the whole intuition here is let us for the shared universal come to discuss the object and look at the different viewpoints. And with this accepting that there is a diversity of viewpoints but there is something which is central in the way we can speak for example about love. So the point is not to say at the end of the day all the windows around the ocean are accepting the fact that there is an ocean, there is love. The point is how when you enter into the concept of love and you try to be deep in this concept you understand also that uh, the different viewpoints uh, should be respected, and this, this means that when I mean respected, I mean they are as legitimate as your viewpoint, which is the first attitude is your viewpoint is as legitimate as mine because at the end of the day, it's just a viewpoint. It's just uh, 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 a reality that I'm uh, 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 looking at from where I am. So this is the philosophical framework. Can I just ask a question about that? To what extent is that actually assuming the uh, um, solution to the problem, simply assuming it to exist? Because to understand this notion of love is to say, um, well, there should be some kind of love already, which is the love that allows us to recognize each other's viewpoints and our own viewpoints as simply viewpoints. So you basically you start out with uh, an assumption of recognition or respect or love uh, as a way of saying um, how do we get to this recognition or respect or love? You start out where you should end up in a sense. No. Because you I, assume that, that this I, attitude can actually uh, be the starting point. I mean love gets interesting where it's impossible like in literature where what's the interesting thing about love? It's not love that actually works, that succeeds. It's where it's impossible. Where do values get, get uh, interesting? Val I mean, we all have values. We all agree on most values, but where value conflicts emerge, that's where the, the trouble exists. So the, the assumption I, starting I, there. I don't see that as mutually exclusive. The fact that you are saying yourself, it's when it's in conflict that it's interesting. You also acknowledge the fact that before the conflict, they are there. So we agree on that. So yeah. it's, not con it's, we, it's not a contradiction in terms. The point for me is not, in fact, I, I wouldn't, and, and if this is what implicitly you can see in my work, that the fact that it's there before means we are not going to face conflict afterward, that's not the point. I think that conflict is part of what it, it should be to get this inner peace when it comes to inner or intimate uh, uh, diversity, but also uh, within the community, what we should do is really to acknowledge the fact that there is something which is a postulate in my position, that there is a concept of human being where, yes, we are dealing with diversity and this is our natural state. 
and meaning that we are dealing with diversity, our natural state is conflict, is not peace. We are at peace with ourselves and at peace with, our, with the other. It's going to be a conflict that we have to resolve. The point for me here, which is a philosophical postulate, I posit that there are dimensions on which we are going to agree if we are atheist, agnostic, Buddhist, Hinduist, or monotheistic, we can find agreement. That's true. I acknowledge the fact that you might talk about love in another way, but there is something which is an intuition that we know without words what love could be. I, I, I think that this is, this is a respect as well, that the fact that, for example, to acknowledge my, my very existence uh, and then uh, you acknowledge that I can be a threat or I can be a, a brother or a sister in humanity, this is the starting point. So I would say yes, they are common ground. There would be no diversity if somewhere we cannot find something which is on which we agree that there is a common dimension. It doesn't mean, once again, and I agree with this, it doesn't mean that we have to romanticize the whole thing by saying it's going to be peace and love, or it's going to be conflict. And I think, in fact, at the end of the day, there is no peace as a final state if there is no conflicts to be solved with ourselves and with the other. Okay. Can, I, can I ask you a further question about this? Because you speak of the, the need to come to a, a new kind of we. Um, in a sense, it's like you want to replace or uh, complement the World Wide Web with a World Wide We. Uh, like, uh, and and that, has, that has, of course, the problem which you address of uh, our world being a world of nation states, which uh, leads to the, uh, the devastating uh, distinction between uh, you and me as citizens, and then uh, lots of people as non-citizens, as illegal aliens, illegal immigrants, etc. Right now, this moment, there is a, uh, an eight-month pregnant uh, woman in a uh, Rotterdam prison because she is an illegal immigrant. She's being held there. Uh, so, uh, gross violations of human rights are the consequence of us being embedded in these nation states. Um, you address this, but you don't really point out uh, in which way we would be able to move beyond that. To me, this idea of a cosmopolitan public sphere would be one way of addressing uh, alternative possibilities. But maybe I can get you to say something about this, this, this notion of a sort of yeah, sh universal we, and how does that relate to our present situation of being divided up, chopped up into nation states, and if you fall out of them, then y you're basically lost. Yes, but I think that this is part of what I have been trying to do in this uh, and then afterward, I, I, I continue in, in, in anything. Before this, I, 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 I wrote the, the manifesto for a new we, which is this, the, 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 the heart of this discussion, and then I, I discussed this here as well. And, and once again, I think that there are three steps. The first one, because um, there is something which is part of my own experience, even in interfaith dialogue or philosophical dialogue, uh, my experience was, at the end of the day, very often we speak about our respective beliefs and our respective values at the periphery of what we think in order just to, be, to have a, a, a peaceful coexistence. While I think that the true dialogue is not to, to dialogue at the periphery, is to make the center's dialogue. And the center's dialogue means that in our society today, when we are driven by forces that are now pushing us to come back to a very narrow understanding of citizenship, a narrow understanding of identity, a narrow understanding of culture, it means that we are reducing our culture, our identity, even our citizenship to some formal dimensions of belonging to that are driving us towards conflict and to say, this is us versus you. The only way for me today, which is the way of resisting, the new way is not an act of dreaming, is an act of resistance. By saying, if you and me, we come to the very essence of what does it, to, you belong to what first? 
Do you belong to a very emotional attitude towards your culture and nation that you are Dutch first emotionally and yet look at who is not really Dutch, which is exactly what you are working on? Or do you come to, I belong to some principles, to some political and philosophical attitudes when it comes to equality, when it comes to human dignity, when it comes to I belong to my principles and this is the way I should think about my nation. I don't belong to my nation for getting my principles, which is what we are now pushed to do and accepting in the name of our belonging to a nation state, racism, xenophobia, as a healthy attitude to protect ourselves. I think that an act of resistance is to, I'm sorry, the new we is questioning the very narrow understanding of what it means to belong to a very narrow understanding of citizenship. And at the end of the day, something which is accepted now, which was said by populists yesterday or far-right parties yesterday, and it's now common, mm -hmm. is, for example, the way, as you were saying, the way we deal with immigrants. Mm -hmm. In fact, what you are talking about is clearly an act which is criminalizing immigrants in the name of a very narrow understanding of what it means to be a Dutch citizen. And I think that if we don't resist with a new we by saying the new we is based on human values, or it could be spiritual, or it could be whatever, but they could be common, and we act on equality, non-discrimination, we act on mainly something which is uh, uh, essential because it, it starts there, in education. The, you know, the, the, the real understanding of uh, a, 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 a power relationship is tell me how you teach, how you, you, you teach your, your, your citizens and, and where you, 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 they are in schools and the way you deal with schools is a way you can deal with equality. I would say that this is quite deep. So I wouldn't translate the new we into something which is a worldwide web we as you, you describe it, is something which is much more than that. It's really an act of resistance, philosophical resistance, social resistance, cultural resistance to narrow, superficial and emotional belonging yeah. uh, to which we are uh, pushed now. Yeah. Well, in a sense, that also, that's also a kind of resistance to an only legal concept of citizenship. Um, because it's a legal concept of citizenship that locks us into our uh, formal statuses. Now that is very important, so that, that resistance is very important when it comes to people without a formal status. So the uh, illegal immigrant, for instance, the, nation, the, the, the people without a nation. Uh, on the other hand, I think we're in a bit of a double bind here. Because when in our European nations we speak of the problems of non-integrated immigrants, most of the time now we are dealing with people who have a formal status. So there we are basically tinkering with their formal status by introducing a moral status. We are moving from a formal citizenship to moral citizenship. Like in the Netherlands, it used to be that if uh, immigrants were to attain a formal citizenship, like get a passport, they would be done with integration. It would be the crowning achievement. Now, most uh, uh, allochtones who are problematized for not being integrated enough, they have formal citizenship, so now it's moral citizenship that is problematized. Now it's, it comes down to, well, you may have a passport, but uh, how loyal are you to the Netherlands? Do you have the right values, etc.? So there, the resistance against formal citizenship is actually something that's done by the state. There's actually something that's very problematic. And in a sense, in your story, there's a, there's a double bind then, because we need to resist the formal concept of citizenship, but at the same time, when we do that, we sort of discursively disenfranchise all those who have attained formal citizenship, who have this legal status, and uh, who, who are then sort of, uh, who, which is then sort of loosened which is then uh, taken away from them by moralizing their behavior. How do you see, yes. the, how do you deal with this tension? No, that, that, that's a very important point, and there is a tension here. While I would say two things here is, and you are working on this, and this is something which is central. I am quoting you here by yes, saying- Yes, this is very good. That, yeah, I know, <laughs> this, is the, the, this is the best sentence of the book. I knew that. But uh, this is why I'm quoting it again. Uh, but uh, 
there is a you are saying something which is which is important and I have been experiencing it myself you know I'm, I was born and raised in Switzerland I am a Swiss by uh, nationality and still I have people like the Swiss People Party that are questioning my very citizenship by saying you are too much a Muslim to be a good Swiss, which is the case of so many you know, Muslims and, and people from Moroccan uh, uh, background here or Turkish background here and throughout Europe. This is something which is not only, by the way, it's not only Europe, it's starting in Canada and it's starting in the States now. So the West is questioning the very essence of what it means, in fact, to be a citizen in the country and it's problematic. How are we going to react to this? By just accepting this, which is once again a power struggle. You have the state, which is the, 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 the superstructure and the, uh, 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 the, the framework through which you are questioned, and you have political parties, populists, that are using this and the power of the state to push you to prove that you are more citizen than other citizens, and you are always on the defensive. How are we going to get out of this logic, which is very negative because it's accepting a kind of structural racism within, structural injustice within. The point is exactly exactly here that I have. I, I, I want the, the citizens to question the very philosophy of the whole thing, what it means to be a citizen now, and to say, look, I have two things to do. The first one is not to accept, to be questioned at the periphery of my belonging, but I want to come at the center of our common philosophy. So I, want, I don't want just to, just to talk about the way the, the law are treating me and say, okay, let us come to what do you mean by, by equality? What do you mean by freedom? What do you mean by being a citizen? So I want to question the very essence of what citizenship means today and not only getting the passport. This is one. The second, which is much more important for me, it's really here to come, and this is what I'm, I'm trying to, to do by, uh, by, in fact, being today. You know what I'm saying? It's not a joke. When I'm saying to the people who came and were born and raised or came at the second generation and say, now you should tell anyone who is talking to you about integration, you stop him and say, I don't care. Integration is over. Integra and the best way, as I'm always repeating this, the best way to go beyond integration is to stop talking about integration. What I want with this new we is to be a contributing factor. To do what, in fact? To help and to be a driving force with other citizens reconciling the West with its own values. So a driving for saying, in fact, in the middle of this society, you are now dealing with contradictions. You speak about equality, but we are not. You speak about the same rights on the job market. There is no same rights. There is clear discrimination, and not only between men and women, it's now between the true citizen, the indigenous citizens, and the others. That after I want to re-question this. So by being assertive as to the rights and not obsessed with the law. Because the way you read the law, it's an act of power. There is no law without power. Anyone who is always coming to law and telling you, oh, the law is talking, you say, who is reading the law? Tell me who is reading the law, I will tell you where is power. So I want, I want this to be part of the whole process. So it's not the philosophy of passive, you know, dreaming people say, yes, you and me, love, peace, equality. <laughs> no, we're going to struggle. We're going to fight. <laughs> good, good. I, I like that. Um, <coughs> well, uh, um, actually, until when do we have? Do we have to f some time to struggle some more? You have, yes, we, you have another 10 to 15 minutes good. because we started Good. Time. Well, I, uh, what you said about the, the, the nation, I agree with that. In a, in a sense, the nation is, um, is a racist mechanism, uh, both internally and externally. Uh, in the way that it excludes and in the way that it selectively, it selectively includes uh, uh, the nation, which comes from the word nasere, which means to be born, is a racist concept. And to move beyond that is, uh, I think, uh, one of the central tasks. How to do, how we're going to do that is, of course, uh, another thing. And uh, it's also something that one can wonder uh, 
to what extent that really has to do with our daily life, with the daily life of most people? Because most people tend to live in the nation and to feel themselves, even in an embodied sense, to be part of a nation. So, to, uh, so, so that would be one question. How do you really, your, your plea for a philosophy of daily life, how does that uh, link up with such very fundamental notions of rethinking citizenship and rethinking the nation? Second question is then, um, to what extent, and I want to politicize it a bit more here, to what extent is it not necessarily necessary here to really include a critique of our global capitalist economy in this? Because in, 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 in essence, it's the structural inequalities that turn people against one another. In the Netherlands, for instance, there is a very, uh, it's very clearly uh, that, it's very clear that those whose integration is problematized are also those with relatively poor chances on the labor market, as you say. And when you speak about the law, I'm, I'm reminded of what Anatole France uh, said. Uh, he said uh, that in Paris, uh, it was uh, equally forbidden for all citizens to sleep under bridges, both for the poor and and for the rich, but of course it's the, the poor who are going to be affected by this. So the law is not neutral, as you say, and the law is not neutral in a very economic sense. So uh, I'm, I'm not going to bring in the Occupy Wall Street movement here, but to what extent do you want to link your story up with this more encompassing critique? Because the new we might come very close to the 99% that the Occupy movement. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, the first question about how are we going to do that? Uh, I think it's a multi-dimensional approach. It's not only one thing to do, but I would say that the essence and the philosophical approach of to to this is really, as I was trying to 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 to, to put it, is to try to start with uh, uh, yourself, the center. How do you f see yourself within the society? At the end of the day, there is a psychological factor. When you are day in, day out, ask about, are you going to integrate? Your, your, your personal psychological way of dealing with your own citizenship is shaped in a way which is not really, you don't really belong. The starting, the first act of resistance here is to work on the psychological dimension the sense of belonging, that you belong to this country. So it means that not only you have rights, but you have a being. And this being is to be able, and this is coming also, you know, when I, I, I'm talking to the Muslims from within the, the, the Islamic reference, is to say, you should be able to say, as you heard in the past, these are my people. This is your country. So this is your country means don't have your heart there and your body here have your mind, your heart, and your body here, and make it the place where you have to be the driving force for justice, for equality, and for respect from a philosophical viewpoint, and to be able to say the starting point even with diversity, because we cannot just try to uh, uh, hide it. Today, one of the main factors is the European and Western conscience that Islam is an otherness, is a foreign religion. To start by saying, I'm sorry, Islam is a Dutch religion, and then I'm here, this is my citizenship. Don't question my citizenship through my culture or my religion. And then you, so the psychological factor is quite important. And I think that in the discussion between Gandhi and Abenka, it's also dealing with psychologies, the way you look at yourself to say, I don't accept this minority business. I don't know, you know, when the people are, when I'm talking like this, by the way, I'm not talking as a minority. I don't know, as I was repeating, and we had this discussion, there is no minority citizenship. I am a citizen, I am speak as a, minority, uh, as a majority, not as a minority, and I'm coming with values that, are, that we are sharing. And here there is something which is an intellectual, so a psychological and intellectual factor to start with. And then this is the civil society where we have to work within education, within the many fields, for example, the job market, and to reconcile ourselves with politics when too many people want us to be dis diverted, talking about cultures and, and you know, uh, it's uh, dialogue, that's all fine. But when dialogue is a way to avoid talking about politics and power, it's wrong. When culture is a way to avoid, to, you know, all this alliance of civilization, I, I have been there every, but every time I repeat, if you are talking about alliance of civilization because you don't want to speak about dominant and dominated, 
it's not going to make it because you are talking from or you like Azna who once told me you know Mr. Ramadan there is only one civilization I said okay the civilized people and the others I said thank you I'm outside then this is what he wanted to say to Muslims come in because we are the civilized people so I think that this is very dangerous but he's saying with his words something which is implicitly everywhere in the discussion is that you have to prove you have to enter and this is problematic the second point and which is critical this is 10,000 words and I was not going to tackle the economic factor but if you read all the other books that I have been writing radical reform for example or the the, the last book just now I just finished a book on on the, the the new Middle East the Arab awakening by saying the economic factor is central it's not a discussion about law it's not a, a question of politics it's a question about you know the Arab awakening will be nothing if there is no with political freedom economic stability and justice just to have a new kind of controlled democracy with the economic capitalist order the way it is is not going to make it and it's true is as well here so i think we have to question this we have to question not only the in fact we have to question all the centers of power and the economic order is one of the the main uh, 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 center for power where democracy is forgotten, where we are not talking about democratic things and we are not talking about the democratic dynamics, uh, and this is where we are challenging our daily life. So I completely agree. The consistent way of dealing with this will be not only, it's multidimensional. So the economic dimension, the critique of the economic order, the neoliberal economic order, the way it is now, and protesting and resisting, for me, it's essential. There, there is no way to come to a consistent discussion here if we don't get to this. La one last point that I, I wanted to make, which is connecting today uh, our discussion here, because very often I'm asked, what will be the consequence of what is happening now in the Arab world in the Middle East, in North Africa, in Tunisia, or in Egypt and other countries with us here. Are we talking about the same thing? And at the end of the day, remember that when the whole movement started, we were asked, oh, are they Islamists? And then we forgot this and said, no, they are not Islamists. They are, these are young people. They are not at all Islamists, and they are not they, they, there is no ideological uh, uh, categories that we can use. These were people saying no to dictatorship. So we forgot that they were even Muslims. They have our values and we forgot. And then after the elections, oh, it might be that they are choosing Islamists. So they, they were the alien, then the same, then the alien again. And the point is always what? With the relationship with power, and we hope that they will go for the democratic processes, while all our discussion is very superficial about what is happening there, because we speak about politics and democracy in a very polarized way between the secular, secularist and the Islamist, and we don't touch the essence of everything, which is mainly what will be the future economic order there. Because if they are not getting, you know, economic independence, in fact, we are not going to have true democratic process. So you can see that the way we culturalize even what is happening there, it's exactly the same way that we are culturalizing our citizenship. At the end of the day, we are cultural object, not dignified subject, economically speaking and politically speaking. And I think that this is the question that we have to ask. Thanks very much. I think uh, this uh, will be taken over now. Hello? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to give our audience a chance to also contribute to the discussion and response. And I think you've left us hanging on a cliff. You almost went there with the Occupy movement, Willem. I think maybe somebody is going to bite the bait. I'm not sure. But first, I just wanted to actually ask um, Wendeline to give her an opportunity to respond to the conversation or not. I'm not sure, because in a way, we've already seen 
um, your work, and we were debating a little bit whether this would stand or if if you would like to um, offer a quick response. But I think, yeah. Thank you. Um, it's um, because I, I, uh, of course, I cannot join this this conversation uh, on the on these terms because I'm somehow I don't feel. Um, that that's my way of expressing myself or something. But what I do like to say is that um, when I made the work that is, uh, that was made, um, let's say, whatever, eight months ago or something, um, there was another word, uh, and there, were other, there, there was another word that was really clearly playing a role for me, which is polyphony. And um, so I was actually thinking that this, uh, what the proposal of the point of views, which comes up in your book, uh, I like to think, or maybe through, through my work, I think about it as the voices. So there, I'm, to, I'm working with voices, and in, in this particular work, I thought, like I call it a, a, a polyphonic mini-tragedy. So I had a, a few concepts together, polyphonic, mini, like it was only 13 minutes long, <laughs> and it was a tragedy. And this tragedy became also quite an important form, formal uh, structure, but it also has to do with the fact that um, there were a certain amount of um, uh, issues at hand that actually they find no resolution. So they actually act, as, uh, there is a sort of a fatalistic ending. And... Um, which is, you know, part of whatever daily daily life as well. Um, but the polyphonic is in. I'm always trying to work out what that could mean. Uh, on a first level, for me, it means something like um, there are a number of voices that have no. Let's say there is no hierarchy in the sense that there is one voice guiding and the other ones will like melodically uh, join in a harmony. But there are very many voices that even in conflict perhaps can become one sound, which is like the productive sound. And how does that actually, how will that be possible? That's what I try to work out through, the, through making the work, let's say. And in this particular work that I made with you, I, I have your voice and I have, let's say, five voices of younger, much younger people. And somehow, <laughs> sorry, they are 16, 17, sorry. Well, people like me or? <laughs> <laughs> Old and young are all uh, relative, as uh, I very well know. <laughs> but uh, it just is actually to say, actually I did want to say something about that. Because <laughs> it's about, like, there is... Um, when I, when I, in my mind, hear the... Because I'm really s sorry, but I'm trying to speak from the work because I don't, I don't have any sort of another, another position to speak from. So I, I hear these, these uh, different voices with very different nature of speech. So we hear your voice and your, your, um, your ideas being uh, proposed in a particular form of speech and a particular voice, and the idea of the kids or the, the younger people, as they are younger... <laughs> <laughs> they, they come with a different voice, but they, I hoped through the work to put them exactly on the same level of um, as understandability, uh, um, let's say, uh, clarifying, like um, making, making something clear in the same way. But they have a different voice, and, not, and each, each of them has a different voice, obviously, but they come more as a group because they sort of act together in one space. Um, as, as, as you come in another space. Uh, just, yeah, that was just one of my proposals to, as a reaction maybe to um, what I've read and what I've heard. Thank you. Thanks very much. This is a good opening. Oh, did you want to say something else? Maybe later. Okay. Um, so this is a good opening for all of your voices to be heard, I think. Does anybody have any questions or comments? Do I see some hand up? Yes? No, I thought I saw a hand up. Yes or no? Okay. Definitely. Okay. Hi. It was nice you brought up the love issue and when you started it was more a bit of a dismissive of love, um, not quite embracing it and then when we look at your work actually you're really embracing it and you see scholars like Karen Armstrong who are really embracing the word compassion um, and then realizing that in Netherlands actually the word compassion doesn't even exist, whatever it is, it, it's actually some sort of a pitiful, there's some sort of sense of pity 
rather than compassion. I mean, we were having a hard time to translate it even for the cultural plan. Um, but the idea of love, I mean, in the times of ir irreligious tolerance, it's, called, it, it's a word that has a bit more of a pity element. You don't agree? What's the word? Uh, I don't think... Uh, Compassion yes. is the I sense of, I mean... I think we have the word. Yeah, but it has a bit of a pity in it. It's, 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 it's a bit of a mercy, pity element, like tolerance somehow is deconstructed that way. Anyway, um, you don't agree? That's good. I want to hear all about that. And I also want actually everybody to write about tonight and send it, their experiences and their take tonight. But in terms of the love, also 16th century, like Flemish thinkers, they talked a lot about love. There's the House of Love, a sect um, that was active in, uh, in Antwerp. In, you know, thinkers like Erasmus or Lipsius, they were talking about being Catholic on the facade, but internally they were actually writing a lot about love. And the same thing, the idea of Unus Mundus, which is the worldwide we, that existed also in 16th century. You know, again, f the Belgian alchemists, Flemish alchemists, then revived maybe by Carl Jung, and all of that, that we share a bit of um, collective consciousness. Why? What? Oh, I should mean to mention more Dutch. <laughs> and the idea of the 12th century, you know, how in Mongolia, let's say, religions were debated out, the idea of God, for instance. So you would have a Nestorian monk and a, and a Franciscan monk and an Islamic imam and, um, and a Buddhist, you know, coming in front of the Han, talking it out in a public debate. So it's actually in history. In 12th century, we have it. In 16th century, we have it. I mean, we have this constant. So maybe it is also when we're looking at, at all this material, it's good to kind of look what happened over the time, what we learned from each other. You know, if you want to prove Jesus existed, you need to go to China because the, 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 the kings that saw the stars, uh, you cannot prove it in Bethlehem or Syria. You can only prove it in China. So there's actually, it's true, they're only recorded in China by Taoist astrologers. So it's very interesting to, as we are in this internet phase, that we can constantly learn from each other and make it more about the collective consciousness. Um, and Sh can I, can sure, I say please. something about that? I just want to provoke that. Yeah, okay. well... <laughs> For starters, I would not say that I would, I would like to be dismissive of love. I think my wife would not <laughs> agree with that. And um, uh, so, so I, would, I did not mean that. And of course, in this sense, if you mean love, it's like the notion, it's, there's a difference between, for instance, the Greek eros and, and agape. And agape is like what we call nast and liefde in the Netherlands. It's like the love of a Christian community, keeping a community together. And uh, I think that can be very important. My point about love was more that, in a sense, I... Uh, I mean, I get the, 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 the point that you make about the need to psychologize. On the other hand, psychologizing or individualizing too much as this idea of love has the uh, possibility to do, I think that tends to be problematic when we are dealing with very structural inequalities and very structural things that need to be addressed. Then uh, a focus on love can simply depoliticize. So, but maybe you have something else to say about that. No, I, I agree. You know, if you, in everything that I have been writing over the last 25 years, you will always find the centrality of the concept of love. That, that's, that's part of everything, the spiritual dimension, the philosophical dimension, the, in literature, anything that I am writing in, you know, in, in poetry. This, this was for my first, in fact, uh, study was on this. There is one thing which is important for me now that I can understand is the point is not to, to, to talk or not about love. I think we have to. It's the way we do that. It's the way we approach the concept. Because the problem is that in many, in many ways when we culturalize or come to even psychologize everything in our discussion, we talk about love to avoid talking about other dimensions. For me, love should not be the word that we are using to speak about our self forgetting the other dimension. It's not a pretext. So this is why, you know, I very much read and followed everything which was central in the Gandhi's tradition, 
But I liked someone telling him, be careful. At one point, you speak so much about the Son of God that you don't talk about the fact that they are oppressed. So your love becomes a pretext for them not to stand up. I don't like this. I don't like someone to tell me, love and sit down. You understand the point, which is central here, is even in the Christian tradition, love is power, is stand up, be courageous. In the name of love, love should give you courage. Detachment in the Buddhist tradition is just you love so much and you respect so much the human dignity that you are not going to accept anything which is undignified. It's not love with passivity, is love with action in the name of love so this is something which is important it's to have this active dimension detachment at the same time courage and to be able to connect it with everything i would say that the centrality is to connect it even with the way you struggle for human beings and and you know when myself i was reconciled with the concept of love was with liberation uh, theologians in south america but the people were saying, look, we read the, the Bible with the eyes of the poor, but we are not going to accept any kind of injustice, to accept injustice here because you are going to be justly treated in the afterlife. That's not our business. Our business is justice now, because there is no love if there is no justice. It's like peace. No, pee, no justice, no peace. So no justice, no real love. And I would say that, for example, when you speak about love even between two uh, persons, it's exactly the same. Don't avoid talking about the potential power struggle between two in the name of love. This is the way the people are manipulating the other by saying, I love you, I can't manipulate you. That's a joke. And it's dangerous even, if you understand what I mean. So I would say I don't have a problem with the centrality, I don't want it to be a pretext to avoid something else. What, can I jump in just because I'm curious about this. Um, there is something that has arisen a couple of times in your discussion. I think, Willem, you're a lot more distrustful of even considering the nation as a fundament for um, something that could produce the cosmopolitan public sphere that you are aiming for. Or you were very skeptical of the nation as a kind of obstacle towards this, it seems like. In your writing, I think there is still a kind of argument to commit somehow. Don't, you know, don't split yourself, but actually commit. And I'm, I'm curious where love comes in there, because there, you know, in the European tradition, but in other traditions as well, we're, we're coming with a kind of uh, fear of, I certainly come with a fear of uh, love of my nation or something, which sounds super freaky at this stage in the game. Um, and yet, that is one dimension of a kind of non-individuated love that we could discuss. So I'm curious what you would say um, about that, just plainly, about the love of a nation and also about other dimensions of group love. <laughs> Well, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to give an expose about love in general, but, uh, go you know, ahead, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. I want to hear that. <laughs> I'll tell you later. But, um, no, I think uh, I'm not per se, I'm not saying the nation, the nation is uh, a bad thing per se. I think the nation is, uh, has lots of potential. In my new book, I make actually a plea for a kind of nationalism, but it's a critical nationalism. And that is to say, if we want to solve the big problems of today, which are economic problems, ecological problems, Nations might not be such a bad idea because they involve regional loyalties and regional solidarities, but they need to critically uh, um, um, to critically 
uh, pose themselves against uh, other nations and to recognize that they are actually part of, a, of one system which is chopped up and divided into nations. And we tend to forget that. We tend to universalize in a very particular way uh, the nation because we say, for instance, in the Netherlands, well, we are a tolerant society. So we say, well, our, our nation, which is bounded and very particular, is actually universal. And because it's universal, you cannot be a part of it, which is a strange thing to, to, uh, to, to pose it, uh, to, a strange way of posing it. So I think there is a critical potential in the nation, if only for the recognition of a, a kind of collective solidarity, a collective loyalty, also a kind of responsibility, for instance, to that you live upon. So the nation has potential, but at the same time, the way the nation is organized now, is part of an international management of populations. It's a, so the world population is divided into several nations, and whoever falls out of a nation has real pr uh, problems. This is the problem that Hannah Arendt referred to when she said one of the biggest problems in the 20th century will be the, 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 the problem of the stateless person. Where what to do with the stateless person is a direct consequence of, of chopping the world up into these nation states. And that's, I think, what our discussion centered upon, how to move beyond that. I think one starting point would be to say, well, we need to create spaces that are not bound to the nation. And a first um, um, way to do that, I think, is to, to participate in a cosmopolitan public sphere, which, which is, of course, an ideal. It's something on the horizon. It's never actually achieved as such, but it's a way uh, of creating a space of thematizing these problems that these nations actually create. Pro pro nations tend to think of themselves as solutions, but they are at the same time very much problems. And it's of course also to recognize, I mean you referred to Gandhi, I like, I like Gandhi's quote when he was asked about what he thought about uh, Western civilization. And he said, well that would be a good idea. So. <laughs> A cosmopolitan public sphere is also a way of decentering our Western conceptions. Uh, it's also, I mean, in a sense, you said it's reminding the West of its values, of its of its core principles. And uh, I like the fact that that r remembrance comes from a place that the West thinks is from outside. So it needs to be reminded of itself by something it posits as coming from outside. And then there's you, of course, saying, well, it's not from outside, because we're already here. Yes, I think, is that an answer to the expose about love? <laughs> <laughs> no. By the way, I, I completely agree with what you are saying now. I think that this is, I, I would say that on this, I, I completely agree with the, the tensions and, and the, the fact that it's, uh, it's necessary, but at the same time, it's problematic. Uh, when people are talking about, you know, for example, uh, uh, a worldly citizenship or being citizens of the world, I'm saying this is for me problematic. It depends how you deal with this. Let us, let us try to be realistic. If you look at the people around you, ordinary citizens, there is something which is willing it or not. You may say, no, you can't say my country first or, or, my, or, or you know, uh, belonging to a country and my nation. At the end of the day, there is something which is very powerful when the people are connecting to a nation. It's from culture, it's from sports to politics. If you look at, for example, what we call the Arab Spring now, for people who are liberating themselves from dictatorship, Tunisians, are concerned with Tunisia, Egyptians with Egypt. The fact that they are starting to get a sense of South-South relationship is not there. It's my country. And if you deal with some of the people, they think it's going to start with my country. So when you win a football match, or when you think about liberating your country, there is a feeling that you belong. And I would say that it would be silly or counterproductive to act against it. How do you use it for the better? And this is where I think, when I was talking at the first time, when I, I, I launched this uh, manifesto for a new way, I said, national movements of local initiatives. So you are a citizen somewhere, in a nation or in a specific you know, uh, 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 city, 
be connected with this. This is where you have to act. But the problem is to act in this way locally with people and, and creating networks, this is the way you are an active citizen. But at the same time, we have to nurture this local commitment with an understanding which could be the, the cosmopolitan philosophy, it's something which is beyond the, the values and the people who are the people who are within. So it's something which is a philosophical or an education that is not reducing your citizenship to a feeling here, but to an understanding which is beyond the nation reality. So how do we do this? This cannot be done by denying the feeling in order to get the philosophy, or, uh, or stressing on the feeling and forgetting the philosophy and the values. This is where the balanced approach is. But I would say acting against the feeling that you belong to a nation, it's, it's, it's not realistic. It's not going to work. Uh, my, my point was, would be use it and educate the people. It's exactly the same with, uh, at, at the end, it's the same with love. You have people, no, but that's true. I'm serious about it. You have people, the way they love is very selfish. And I wouldn't act against love because some people are very selfish. I would say you might have to educate yourself to love in a better way. There are ways of loving that should be studied or at least uh, improved. We'll ask Willem's wife. <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, sharing your values and thoughts with us tonight. Uh, I have a question on the uh, act of resistance. Um, I think, actually, it's, we sh first of all, sorry? Sure, yeah. Yeah, on the act of resistance. So the first step would be really to create or raise this awareness on this act of resistance. And for me, resistance also means that we have to defend ourselves from and um, try to um, protect ourselves from. So how do we avoid, in this long process of creating the awareness, the violence? So violence in terms of physical violence, but also psych psychological violence? Or is it worth, I mean, is it important to avoid violence? Maybe it's a question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, am I advocating violence? Uh, no, I, I, I think it's, it's, it's a central question. When, when you are trying to, to, to when you are you know, all my, my, at the end of the day, to be clear, all my philosophy that you are a good citizen and you try to, to, to protect as much as you can, or you end up, like some today are saying within the cultural discussion, the best way for you to be accepted by the majority is to become an invisible minority, which is so dangerous, not for the minority, but for the majority. It's dangerous for all. So this is where you have to come with something which is a deep understanding of what it means. What do we mean by this resistance? And I would say that uh, the first is something which exactly had to do with what we were saying and, and something which is important. Is to become the subject of your history means you have to reconcile yourself with your history and your being. Which the first dimension is know who you are not to be <coughs> the object of the perception of the other, but the subject of your history. And this is the way to be assertive. The, the, the only thing that I see here is to be quite clear about what is the substance of who you are and what you want, and not what they want you to be and how they see you. How do you do this? I, I would say it's, it's, uh, it's three things that are important. Once again, I really want to stress on education. Because you know, when you speak about violence, there is, if sometimes you go to some universities, what we teach is quite violent. It's, it's the way you deal with facts and history could be intellectually quite violent. It's not physically violent, but it's a, a distortion that is quite the way you are perceived through the process could be problematic from primary school to secondary school to university. So education, it's important. Now the way you deal with the civil society, the way you are assertive within the civil society and you resist 
all what we were talking about, this, na this way of, uh, you know, the, the, the way you are asked to belong to a country, what is a nation, the way you see us versus them, the immigrants, all this should be in an assertive way, question. But question from, uh, from a position of power. And the position of power is not to have the power, it's the intellectual power to sit yourself as a subject and to avoid pro this protective, defensive attitude. You know, from the Islamic viewpoint, for example, I, I would say that I, I'm, I'm dealing with something which is very deep that I call the crisis of the contemporary Muslim conscience, which is exactly to be always on the defensive, always to try to do as good as, or like them, or to show that we are not doing like them, which is a way to be exactly in the same position. You want to do something else just to prove that you are not like them. At the end, they decide who you are going to be if you don't want to be like them, only because they have the power to impose what they want. So this, to deconstruct all this and to come to something which is uh, this position, uh, this resistance based on principles, based on being a subject on principles, values, and understanding, and being assertive. Now, should we be violent? I wouldn't advocate violence, you know, even in, in all violence, I mean physical violence. Now, I also think that in some situations, history showed us that there are legitimate resistance that you have also to acknowledge. Because today, having these uh, great powers going to kill people everywhere in the world, and then when the people are resisting, we call them terrorists, and we call ourselves you know, legitimate in the way we are promoting war, that's not, that's not the way. So I, I, I would say that the starting point of resistance in the whole business here is terminology. Tell me the words that you are using. How do you, do, do you label the people? Which is also something which is important. Yesterday you were a freedom fighter, today you are a, a, a terrorist uh, and you are violent. So I would question uh, even the, 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 the terminology. But you are touching here a point, a question, which I would say it's, it's really at the center of where I am now in, in my, my quest how do you become a subject that is assertive without being arrogant and resistant without being violent? Or not physically violent, but uh, I don't care being intellectually violent. If someone is calling me, you are bothering, you know what the American intellectual was saying, I don't want you to tolerate me, I want to bother you. I think it's good. <laughs> it's good to bother some people. Is there any more comments, questions? I will start here and then I will come to you. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, thank you for this little booklet. Um, I got it uh, with Christmas <laughs> as a kind of Christmas present from Nicholas Schaffhausen. And then I rang Nicholas, I said, well, um, I'm very happy with the Christmas present from you. Um, not from you, Mr. But it could be. Yes, not from you, Mr. Ramadan, which might be also a good thing, but especially from Nicholas, who was here the director, and uh, being a kind of provocative director in uh, the art, and uh, inviting you to write this, at least, to reflect. And I've been um, searching for, let's say, my own position in finding a shared universal attitude to this question of diversity as the question of human being, of mankind. And trying to give that a position in my understanding of my being Dutch, or at least coming out of a country which has uh, fought a lot of wars and uh, fought a lot of water. And I found out at least a, a question for myself which I would like <coughs> to perhaps debate a little bit about, about the simple fact that we have in the Netherlands a kind of representative tradition, representative de democracy, which comes already from the 12th century. And um, in which in the 18th century introduced the king, we should never have done that, but 
at least uh, we should have continued to to stay on this potential of, let's say, what we call nowadays the polder model. I think you know that word, um, which is a very universal word, perhaps. My, my, that, that at least we had a way to struggle with this question of diversity, but I think always in a position of an external question we had to fight too. And out of that, of course, might come nation states, but that's perhaps a, let's say, temporary thing. It's not so long yet that we have it. The, 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 the 18th century and the 19th century, perhaps we can overcome that period in history. And now we have no longer a kind of external question, although some people would like to reposition our country into a external fight. We even have enlarged our identity to something that might be Europe. Um, we don't know yet what it is, but we know it by heart. And we know it by our coin, but that's an, a way of knowing. And also including knowing diversity as a positive relative thing, that's very interesting of being European, at least so I feel. And then comes the, my, my, my thinking, it's not a question perhaps, but it's more, we had a way of talking. We had a way of decision making. Um, you could say that is tolerance, but I don't want to use that word. It was a kind of very intellectual and good organized process of taking decisions in a very uh, public way. And that was already very old. So how should we introduce this, let's say, this way of thinking into a kind of reframing our way of doing? Because that's what I'm searching for behind the book, not in the book. It's there. It's not in the book. It's perhaps behind the book or in the next book or I don't know. But at least uh, the, so, so searching for is our, where we have lost our way of doing and I am searching for to reintroduce it or to find out a better way to do it. Perhaps you can help me a little bit. Uh, it was not even behind the book because I'd ha I had no idea about uh, uh, going further to a specific case in, in, in the Netherlands. Um, what you are saying about uh, uh, acknowledging the fact of this diversity within and now having people talking about this diversity outside uh, or from outside the, the, the reality. I think that uh, you had an experience as all the other European countries, uh, which was both based on facts and based on self-perception that we are doing very good with diversity and we had an internal dynamic uh, uh, with this diversity and, and trying to get a sense of how do we deal with do we, we are going to deal with it. And it worked more or less because we can't just idealize the past. You had people who were facing uh, coming in this country discriminations and, and even though we, we kept on repeating in this country the more liberal, liberal society it might be at some point that it was more liberal than others, but it was not a liberal society by essence. Now you have a reality which is the change within the society in the Netherlands. And there are two common, common dimensions, or uh, uh, co concomitant dimension. One is uh, being part of Europe and all the questions, and you have uh, powers that are saying it's problematic within Europe, or even if we acknowledge the fact that we are Europeans, we understand that we are losing some dimension of our identity. And from within now, you have people who are now Dutch and they are citizens and they have a diversity of backgrounds and it's creating a problem. And the driving force in your country now, uh, the politicians that are saying, setting the scene of this discussion are populists, if not some of them far-right parties. In fact, they are using, uh, they, they can see the change, but they are using this diversity by spreading a, uh, around fears about uh, 
about this, uh, the very essence of these people who are not really Dutch. Now, how are we going to struggle against this if we don't want, once again, to uh, uh, just use the, 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 the rhetoric of the past and not question our policies today within the society? And the first thing which I would acknowledge or I would advise the Dutch government and the Dutch society to do is to come back to politics and to avoid and to just stand up against all these people who are now just telling us the only problem that we have in this country is the very concept of diversity. These people are, are challenging our identity. This discourse is a political discourse, is an ideology that uh, is culturalizing or Islamizing the socioeconomic problems because they don't have socioeconomic solutions. So the point is really to come to what are we doing now? From a political viewpoint, do we have a poli a, a, an educational policy? Do we have an economic policy that is now dealing with equality, with job market, with unemployment, uh, un unemployment and questioning the very essence of, of our policies and not to let us know that uh, at the end of the day our jails are lots are full of Turks, ma more mainly Moroccans and some Turks, because, because they are Turks, because they are Moroccans and the problem is cultural. I think that this discourse now is taking over and, and, and it's, it's driving some political forces and we don't see others resisting this because in fact uh, they want to, 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 to win the next elections and, and today the populists are the best in this business. So if I have an advice, oh yeah, I, I, my perception of what we have to do in Europe now is, is really to stand up with uh, citizens and with political, and inter political parties and intellectuals now coming with questioning three things. The first one is the economic system in itself and how do we deal with it today. The second is our educational system and what do we deal with it. And now the job market and how do we deal with equality in the job market which is, this, uh, this is the main thing, and let alone uh, talking about the media, which is also part. And you know, when I was working here, when I was asked to come and to speak about diversity and identity, I think, let us first talk about education. Second, about job market. This is why we have to come with policies. This is why a municipality should work and stop only talking about the fact that you're Moroccan and Muslims. So, so the very presence of a new new people, new citizens now, uh, is used to avoid talking about the, the, the very essence of the system. And I would say that this is, this is what we have to do today. Without having a clear answer to what should be reform, I could come with which questions should be asked. Now, the way it's structured in, uh, in, uh, in the Netherlands, it's something which is, uh, you know, I, I, I'm telling, I want to tell you something which was surprising for me. Uh, in the civil society. When, for example, and it was a question, really I was asking myself, the way municipalities could work with some organizations at the local level, the way they can give support them financially, at the end of the day, they can't even speak because if they speak out, they are in danger of their social independence. I saw organizations not being able to speak out in, f in, in facing injustices because they were getting money from the municipality. If the civil society is under control through finance, I think it's a problem because at the end, you don't have people uh, uh, speaking out. And I, I would say that this is a problem. I don't know what he said, no, but... No, but suppressed by giving regions or locals money and that they feel perhaps not suppressed but not free to speak when they want to speak or to resist huh? um, that we have such that we have such a social system which is so heavily suppressing groups it's interesting to think over that because you're saying something like that and I, if that I, is I, so, if that is so, I really, uh, it might be, 
It might be. I'm, I, I'm, I'm open to that. Kay. Can I just make a comment here? Yeah, try. Yeah. Um, I think uh, lots of this has to do with a, a Dutch, very Dutch tradition of depoliticizing politics. Um, and this is basically what you refer to as the, the, the polder model, so the Dutch corporatism. It's a way of intricately binding uh, government with civil society. And the idea of a civil society is, of course, that you have a certain distance from the government, uh, a, which is a distance that allows you to be critical, to have a public sphere in which you can really be critical and not, and you, and which you are not always bound to uh, the state. And that is something that is very much uh, um, gone in the Netherlands, in a sense. Our idea of public space as something in which you are free to promote your opinion, for instance, is gone. When we had our uh, Sinterklaas, yeah, have you heard of this? It is our Dutch tradition of Sinterklaas. Well, it's, it, it involves a kind of uh, <laughs> colonial thing where we have um, people looking like uh, slaves from centuries ago. Um, well, how do I explain this actually? <laughs> It has it has colonial overtones. Anyway, there was there was a, a, a Dutch Antillian guy who was protesting against this. He was saying, uh, "This is racism." Actually, he showed a T-shirt in which he said, "It's, it's racism," and he was uh, thrown on, down on the ground, beaten, and got arrested simply for saying in the public sphere, "This and this is racism." So in the Netherlands, we really have this idea that the public p space is something that we want to have clear of, of all dissenting opinions. And the, the, the Burka ban, which, we now, which our cabinet has now approved, is also uh, an interesting example. The, I mean, it's, it's controlling the way, the proper way of communicating in an open society, as it is called, because a Burka obstructs communication because your face is not visible. My idea is, well, the next thing to do then is to ban all weblogs, uh, all Twitter accounts, because I've never seen the face behind uh, that, so which is, of course, a very strange idea, but it's, a, it's, it's an illustration of a Dutch mentality to really depoliticize uh, uh, all pol politics and to draw out of the, to, to say, well, the public sp space and the public sphere is really something that should be state-controlled. And I think that's another thing uh, to critique that is not to say with our prime minister, well, we should not finance all these, all these uh, organizations or whatever. It's a way of uh, guarding the distinctions between state and public sphere. If you are intricately inter intertwined, the position of critique is lost. And actually, our government in 2005, uh, actually our cabinet really said, the active citizen, what is an active citizen? That is a citizen that cooperates with government. It's not a citizen who's critical of government. If that's the case, I don't want to be an active citizen. I would like to give the opportunity for him to make his, ask his last question or make a remark. Yeah. Yeah, one last question. One last question. A very quick one then. Um, you said uh, to go beyond integration, stop talking about integration. So I was wondering if you want to go beyond diversity or super diversity. Uh, do you think at some point you don't have to write about diversity anymore and would it be in the near future somewhere? <laughs> no, it's, it's not exactly the same. By the way, just one thing which is imp Im important in, in this. What I can say through my experience over the last few years and I, I was in the Netherlands is exactly this. I think that the civil society, the Dutch civil society, uh, needs to reconcile itself with learning to say no and to stand up when things are not done the right way, which I think is quite worrying when you see a society where it's not happening. It gives you the impression that people want tranquility or there is a lack of courage. You can decide which is the way anyway. Uh, the point uh, about diversity is not exactly the same as integration. Integration is a, 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 a relationship which is based, it could be a power relationship. It's we, the host society, are waiting and expecting you to integrate you, the minority, or you, the marginalized, or you coming from 
uh, abroad or the other. So when you are part of a society, you know, when I was born and raised after almost 50 years to have people coming to you and say, when are you going to integrate to the Swiss culture? I say, okay, there is a problem here. Because the way it's put, it's a, it's a power relationship. It's, it's my country and you are a visitor. Diversity is not exactly the same. Diversity, uh, the way I, I put it, is, is a philosophical concept saying uh, it's a risk and it's a necessity. Why? Because diversity is also questioning the center of powers. The way you put it, it's, it's, this is why you can use diversity as something which is, uh, uh, in the philosophical term, the fact that we are talking about diversity is from where I am, I'm questioning your power. So it could be something which is a constructive, necessar necessary concept in anything that I have to do with my own life. For example, when I'm talking about myself, when I'm talking about diversity and saying I have uh, uh, multiple identities and this diversity within, it's, it's critical for me. I would say I can't speak about humility if I don't speak about diversity. The way I deal with, and humility for me, it's a key concept. Spiritually speaking and socially speaking, humility is important. Intellectual humility means I don't get it all. I have to listen to what you, you have to say because it helps me to be myself. So, so there is something which is exactly the opposite of integrating into the whole society. Diversity is a, p a potential equal footing and in attention that can come from conflict or come from reconciliation and come uh, uh, through peaceful process. So, so I would never stop talking about diversity, but once again, I don't want diversity to play the role in my understanding and my philosophy the way sometimes love could play a role in other philosophy, which is a pretext by saying, oh, let us talk about diversity. It's a co positive concept to say, no, I'm sorry. Diversity means that you might be different and it might be a struggle and you might be in a position of power or me in a position of power, it could be a struggle and a fight. And at the same time, the, the objective is peaceful. Uh, 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 it's to go towards peace and to, 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 to live together, not in a peaceful way, but in a, an interactive, proactive way. So I, I will use it as a revealing factor of all these dimensions, not a pretext not to talk about all these dimensions. And my, my last point would be where we have to talk about diversity in the philosophical sense. You know, in the book, I, I had a book afterward called the, the Quest for Meaning, and I was saying, you know, we have to reconcile ourselves with four disciplines that we have to teach. The first one, sociology is not one of them, but it could be. Uh, uh, <laughs> no, no, don't say anything. Oh, okay. <laughs> what a book this must be. <laughs> <laughs> the first is history. History, it's critical for, for, I think we need to teach history again. The sense of, you know, uh, the way we deal with the past. The second one is philosophy. And by the way, can, uh, the third one is also history of religions. But I think it's quite important when we live in this world today to have a sense, not, I'm not talking about catechism, I'm talking about understanding the systems, the beliefs of the people. And the fourth one, which is critical for me, is arts and imagination. Because this is where through all this you get the sense that arts is also you teaching you this diversity, this diversity of representation, of expression. So I would say it's central in anything when it comes to us uh, trying to talk, trying to live together, and trying to go beyond the, 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 the very simplistic uh, you, us versus uh, them, and, and things like this. But arts, it's, it's, it's important. I think that many things that we are, we should, uh, for example, in the South, one of my, my main concern now is to reconcile Southern countries with arts and, and creativity. And not only to think about, you know, uh, uh, and I think it's quite important. It's quite important because the powerful have very often the words and very often the representation, the way we 
we, we, we talk about things, we represent things. I think that we have to question this, not only through political struggle, but uh, artistic resistance, meaning you have to be assertive. This is what I meant. Thank you. On that note, I want to thank you, Professor Tarek Ramadan and Willem Schinkel, for this wonderful, thought-provoking conversation. And we want you to assert yourself, so we want you to actually respond to some of the thoughts and propositions that came out tonight. So if you have actually, you know, if you want to respond tonight, please share it with us, send it to Vita Devit. This is an ongoing conversation. This is only the kickstart. There's so much to talk about. You know, if we feel minority or not, Professor Tarek Ramadan said he doesn't feel he's not a minority, but in some cases, as an artist, as an intellectual, as an academician, you might be feeling a minority, or what does majority mean in these times? We should also be looking at religious history, like, um, again Professor Ramadan talked about how much Islam is shaping Europe and European values and how this is not a 20th century history story, this is a long history and how can we look at it now, how Christianity let's say strengthened Buddhism, how religions had an impact on each other over the time. So these are like you know hundreds of years we're talking about, this is not a new issue. In that sense this the studying, examination of history is um, really critical. And also the redefinition of European values. I mean, this is a constant question. What are your thoughts on it? That will be very nice to know, especially in Rotterdam, where I just found out I'm new to Rotterdam. I've been here only for three weeks, but 160 languages. I mean, if we can't resolve it within Rotterdam, where can we resolve it? And in the, in the times when the defenses are so high, like there are defenses so high, especially if you speak to Muslim partners rather than, you know, Dutch uh, partners, ethnically I'm talking again, or not, you know, that's also a question what is ethnic when it comes to Muslimness, but um, what I'm trying to say is when you, when you, when religion withdrew from Netherlands, especially Christianity, and with, when Islam is still so strong in, in terms of its multiple identities, what can we do in the times of when the defenses are high? So what are the tools of self-critique so I think every side has to somehow start from themselves, like you mentioned, whether it's the ego, acknowledging the fact that we should be all expanding because we all want to expand intellectually, emotionally, and financially. And now what do we do with our immediate uh, families? What do we do in our lar larger families and alliances? So there are many questions that we should be answering. If you want to respond to tonight, we're happy to post it on our website. That would be wonderful. And I hope we see you again in the next sessions and sessions. And we want to see you back as well. Thank you, so Thank you very much. The book is for sale outside. Is there a nice little discount today? There's a big discount on the book today since you were here, so please go ahead. <laughs>